Hi, everyone. I'm Carly Krasnopol, APAC Director of Leadership Development. Today's social media environment has become extremely hostile towards pro-Israel voices. Israel's detractors use online platforms to spread vicious anti-Israel hatred and toxic lies. Today, we get to hear from those who are fighting back. Our panel today features three pro-Israel influencers who work to spread the truth about Israel and broadcast a pro-Israel message to hundreds of thousands of followers. Joining us from New York City is Blake Flayton. Blake is a columnist and a new media director for the Jewish Journal. He is also a co-founder of the New Zionist Congress, an organization that seeks to promote the mission of Zionism and its continuity. Blake, thank you for being here today. Hi, Carly. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Joining us from Israel are Emily Schrader and Halal Silverman. Emily is a columnist for the Jerusalem Post and the CEO of Social Light Creative. She is also the co-host of Headlines with the Haddads, where she and her fiancé, Yosef Haddad, talk all things Middle East. Emily, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. And Halal Silverman is a proud progressive Israeli and an associate at the Tel Aviv Institute, where she works to uplift Jews and other marginalized groups through innovative social media driven strategies. Halal, it is great to have you here. Carly. It's lovely to be here. We're going to have a lot of time to talk about the issues, but I really want to start off with all of us really getting to know each other better and hearing your stories. How did you find yourself on the front lines of advocating for Israel on social media? What brought you to this spot in your journey? Blake, why don't we start with you? Yeah, of course. So I always like to start off by saying that if you had told me just three years ago that I would be now full time advocating for Jewish people and making a career uh, in Israel activism online and offline, I would have said you were crazy. It never once crossed my mind. Uh, I had every intention of my career uh, being in politics, in American politics. That's why I went to college in Washington, D.C. Um, I wanted to work for my congressman, which I did. Uh, I wanted to work for a bunch of nonprofits and organizations, and that was my track. That was my major in school. It was a done deal. Um, but at school, uh, in the political spaces, uh, which were progressive and liberal, uh, that I wanted to get involved in and to make friends in and to start my work, my career in, um, I kept on running into this overt hostility to Israel that even to me, who didn't know a lot about you know, things like Israel-Palestine, who didn't know a lot about the history of Zionism, who didn't know a lot uh, about, you know, the contemporary issues facing the Middle East today, um, I knew that it, it, it seemed unreasonable that they were just political criticisms of a country or of a government. It seemed almost right off the bat um, that there was something deeper going on here based on how emotional um, this, this, these attacks against Israel were. And, you know, I had a pretty normal Jewish upbringing. Um, we went to synagogue a couple times a year. I went to Jewish summer camp. Um, and it was at Jewish summer camp where I met lots of Israelis. Um, and I, you know, so I had Israeli friends growing up and, and I had Israeli counselors and, and people that I loved from Israel. So I took it personal that um, such, such crazy things were being said by people who I wanted to be friends with. Things like, you know, anybody who associates themselves with the state of Israel is 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 akin to a Nazi during the Third Reich, um, things like of that nature. And so um, in November of 2019, I decided to write about it um, after uh, a series of anti-Semitic things happened at my university, which I'm sure that we can uh, go into later. Um, and I decided to write about it, my experience and, and my feelings of isolation and ostracism from the progressive spaces on campus that I so wanted to get involved in. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have that experience be published in the New York Times. Um, and it was the top trending opinion piece, the New York Times for I think a week. And that completely changed my life. And I got in touch with 
thousands, and I'm not exaggerating here, thousands of students from all over the world and their parents and uh, so many people asking me about my experience and, and sharing with me their experience and asking me questions about where to go to school, where not to go to school, how to deal with this, how did I get involved with this, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just so overwhelmed by it that it just seemed to make sense that you know, I had a platform now and I had a voice. And so I started speaking out on social media and started, you know, doing the, <laughs> the posting, I guess, that I'm, that I'm still doing today. And uh, I don't regret any of it because it's given me such wonderful opportunities like to be on this panel today. So that's kind of my story. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Blake. I feel like we really just got to know you so much better and it makes me that much more excited for us to continue this conversation. So thank you so much for being vulnerable with us. Emily, tell us a bit about your story. So actually, I was listening to Blake's story and thinking, wow, that's strikingly similar to my background and how I started to get involved as well. I grew up nominally pro-Israel, wasn't a big issue for me, didn't know a lot about it, but I went to school because I wanted to work in American politics. I wanted to work in D.C. That was my, my life plan. I was very involved in a lot of different political groups on campus. Um, and I started getting involved with the Israel issue because of apartheid week. I actually saw the, uh, the apartheid wall that the Students for Justice in Palestine set up on campus um, at USC, University of Southern California. And at the time, it wasn't a particularly hostile school to Jewish students or to pro-Israel students. Um, but that year, the Students for Justice in Palestine was very, very active, uh, more than they had been in the past. And I remember that when I saw this, I said to my friend as I was walking across campus, why are these people so obsessed with Israel? Why are they obsessed with Jews? Like, I don't get it. Okay, they don't like Israel. That's fine. Like, who puts up an entire display like this? Like, you have to have a real, you have to care a lot about this issue. And then I started looking at it closer and I saw that a lot of the stuff on there wasn't true. And at the time I didn't, like, I didn't know that much. I wasn't an expert on this issue, but I knew that some of the stuff that they had written about Israel on that was completely false. So I started to get frustrated with that. And of course they had multiple events uh, demonizing Israel throughout that week. I attended some of them just to sort of see what it was all about. And from there I started getting involved with uh, Chabad, with Hillel on campus, with the Students for Israel, with APAC, with all, all the groups who operate on, uh, on campus. Um, and that sort of set off my activism from school. I also began working for another pro-Israel organization um, at the same time, I was working on a political campaign in California uh, on the digital side. I was doing social media professionally. Um, and so because of my experience in that arena, the pro-Israel organization was like, listen, we don't have a digital department. Do you want to start setting this up and getting active? And so that's how I started getting, you know, getting active on social media with Israel. It actually wasn't my own voice at the beginning. I was working with uh, voices of organizations and then from there, I built uh, the digital department of this organization to over a million followers, actually. Uh, and then I left to start my own company to help others tell their story and also to work on my own content. And I've worked in the past couple of years to develop uh, a lot more activity, be it in articles or in video content or graphics that I share about the issues that are happening in Israel. And I think that one of the reasons that I've been so motivated of late is because I see that in the U.S. and on campuses, it's significantly worse than when I was there. And the way that people frame the issue when it comes to Israel has become more polarized. So as a result of that, it's really become a much larger part of my life than I initially expected it to be. Like, like I expected to you know, be in politics somewhere. And I guess I am in politics, but it's not at all what I had initially imagined. So that's how I got where I am today. That's incredible. First of all, I love your million follower flex. That's incredible. Um, Wow, what is that like? That's unbelievable. And second of all, you know, we work with college students and I think that having you share that you started this involvement and started your pro-Israel activism so intentionally on campus when you're facing this hostility, I think is incredibly inspiring for the people watching. So I'm very excited to get more into that. And last but certainly not least, Halal, our journeys even crossed over for a little bit and we were interns together. Let's hear more about how you found yourself here. Wow, um, I have a, a, more, a more dramatic story. Um, I came into the, into the world of the, uh, pro-Israel activism a little bit differently than, uh, than Blake and Emily. 
Um, I was moved here 16 years ago from the U.S. by my parents. We relocated with uh, my siblings. Um, but it really happened when I was arrested nearly 10 years ago with Women of the Wall at the Western Wall. Uh, my, my mom's a rabbi. I grew up in a very religious but progressive modern world. Uh, so praying with a prayer shawl, a talis, a talit is very much a norm. I um, can't believe it's been almost 10 years. But uh, getting arrested at 17 uh, and kind of fighting this battle online immediately really showed me the power of social media and how we can create progressive good and change in our young, beautiful, vibrant country. So uh, when that all happened, I really got into this whole online world and saw this growing hate between my two different worlds, my two countries, my two peoples. And um, from there, I just never looked back, I guess. Absolutely. And that's a beautiful message for us to all resonate with. Thank you so much, Hollow. Thank so you. let us all live vicariously through you three for a little bit. Give us some of the behind the scenes look at what it looks like to be a pro-Israel influencer. Do you three ever interact online? I know before we got started, we, I briefly heard, you know, Hollow and Blake talking about how you two have obviously met in real life. Do you all get together in real life? Yes. <laughs> yes. We actually- yeah, we have, Hillel and I have hung out in Israel a bunch lately, um, whenever time I'm there. And Emily and I, um, and the three of us actually went to dinner <laughs> just a couple weeks ago. So yes, it's a very in-person and online. It's a very yeah. collaborative space. Amazing. Yeah, and Emily and I have known each other in person for years as well. What are, those con what are the conversations like when you all get together? You know, I have to say, uh, the conversations mostly are like, what we talk about online <laughs> most of the time. Yes, the last time we were together, we talked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and different perspectives and what different activists are talking about, I think, for a couple of hours. So can it's not on, that yeah. dissimilar. Yeah, we, we I guess we live live and uh, and breathe this, uh, this issue. Um, but yeah, we talk about other stuff too sometimes. A <laughs> I love how, how you said unfiltered. I was going to ask, is it different than how you talk online with other people? I mean, with each other being, you know, influencers who all have very similar beliefs on the issue. Right. I think that there's certainly, there's certainly a different tone for me, at least there's a different tone online. You know, some of the opinions that I have about a certain piece of content or a certain political view aren't things that are on my agenda to speak about um, on the content that I create itself. Whereas it might come up in a discussion, even with the person who created it. So there's some things that are for public viewing and some things that aren't, of course, like anything, like any issue. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's awesome that you've kind of built this circle of trust where you can all come to each other and probably talk about how difficult it can be online as well. You know, you've all chosen to put yourselves out there publicly. Um, and as a result, I'm I'm not positive, but I would assume you probably get some anti-Israel hate on your social media as well. What is it like seeing those comments and, and how do you use each other as support systems? So um, I actually commented on this a couple days ago because I was on a panel and they asked uh, a similar question. You know, it, it used to really affect me. Um, it used to be a continual, a continual source of stress. Uh, the people who were criticizing me online or criticize is a very tame word for it, you know, at the harass, end, like harass, harassment or threaten, threaten, hatred, all of that, you know, all of that fun stuff. Um, but what, what really gets me through it and empowers me and inspires me to keep going is just the knowledge that we are living in the most miraculous time in Jewish history, you know, where we have a sovereign country, where we have, you know, so much freedom to be ourselves and to advocate for ourselves openly, things that the Jews of yesterday, our ancestors could only dream about, you know, because the consequences for being openly and proudly Jewish were so much more um, severe and so much more scary. Um, and so, you know, we just have to take it with a grain of salt and realize that we're fighting the good fight and, and, and no good fight has ever been fought in Judaism for the Jewish community without backlash and without pushback um, because the world doesn't like us when we raise our heads and, 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 and speak too loudly. So um, we just got to keep doing what we're doing and, you know, they'll all just fade into white noise. I just want to add, I agree with everything that Blake said. I just want to add to that, that one of the things that myself and I assume Halal, who will probably elaborate on it more, can speak to is that there's sometimes an extra layer. One of the issues that I have spoken about quite a bit is women's issues on social media. And 
when things heat up between Israel and the Palestinians or really Israel and anyone, um, the pushback on social media can get particularly nasty uh, when it comes to women on social media. And some of the harassment and attacks uh, that I have received, especially during the last operation, were really, really shocking. I mean, like crazy threats, death threats, rape threats, like a very misogynistic undertone to a lot of the comments um, and messages that I received. I actually was targeted by Malaysian hackers. Uh, during this last oh my operation, gosh. they tried Same. to they tried to hack a, a couple of us were they tried to hack all of my accounts. They weren't successful. Three cheers for two step verification. Um, but I know that they tried. They even submitted to Twitter that I had died and that whoever it was uh, trying to hack my account was the recipient, like the legal recipient of my account. I mean, crazy, crazy oh my stuff. Gosh. Like they'll, they'll go to great lengths when it comes to targeted. Uh, campaigns. And that tends to happen around different wars. We saw it in the last one. We saw it in 2014 with Suke Tan, saw it in 2012 even. So with more time, there's more activity on social media. And unfortunately, when everybody has the ability to say whatever they want, sometimes without any consequences, it can get real ugly. And I think that the thing that really keeps me going is that Blake said it so beautifully, it's so positive. <laughs> Mine isn't quite as positive. But I think that the reality is that if we don't show up, the starting point of the conversation becomes much further against Israel. Now, you know, we're, we're arguing with people who are saying, you know, well, uh, it's not, you know, anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism, when we know that it is, manifestly it is, in many different instances we've seen that those are one and the same. Um, but if we don't show up and we say, oh, it's a lost cause, which unfortunately some people have, they've been discouraged by what we've seen online, um, then it becomes more difficult for the people who do speak up. We need to be normalizing moderation. And instead, what's happened on social media is that we've normalized extremism. So we have to show up to be able to push back against that. Yeah, I, I don't even know what there is to add beyond Blake and Emily's. Um, that was perfect. But um, it's true. It's really weird how as a woman, you get you, when things escalate in Israel, you get it, the, the, the insults, the attacks, the, the threats becomes physical, you know? Um, when they realize they have no, you're not going to answer politics, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to debate with them, they're not going to ever, it gets very brutal. Um, and it is very important to have a thick skin, what was the, the Shrek thing with the, the onion and the nine, like, but it is important to like, you know, to keep, protect yourself in a way, like, none of that you can let allow past a certain part, or you can't be doing this kind of work. Um, it would just destroy parts of you. Um, I'm thankful that like, when things go down here, uh, we'll sit with other activists, people will pair up in two or threes or fours, just naturally, and they'll be doing this work together through rockets and whatever, and it, it, brings, it brings comfort and it brings love, and um, we have to balance this out with love. I've many spent many we... nights with Hillel working. I, <laughs> I, things flying and just like live tweeting, and it, we have to outbalance the, the negativity and the hate with information and love. Wow. I never would have mm -hmm. imagined that it would be that much more different, but also that much more to your, in your language, hollow, violent towards <laughs> women influencers. And that's so important for us to hear because I, I truly would have had no idea. And I so appreciate you both sharing that because I'm sure it's incredibly difficult. And wow, you are all just so incredibly resilient. Um, I really hope everybody watching feels as mm -hmm. inspired and just in awe of you all as I do. Let's get a little more positive, right? I'm sure I'm, I follow all of you, so I'm sure that you have some positive comments. What do those look like? Can you tell us a little bit more? And can you tell us a bit how, you know, your comment section might change depending on the platform? Because as someone who is horrible on social media, I'd love to learn more about, you know, how you use different platforms to spread different messages as well and how that impacts your comment section. Yeah, um, I guess I can go first. My platform, I guess, that I use the most is... Twitter um, because I don't really know if there's some important explanation behind it other than I'm a writer. Uh, I write a weekly column for the Jewish Journal and so a, a social media platform that is centered around words and around uh, uh, quote tweets and replies just seems to be the best medium for me. Um, however, that is the and that 
simultaneously is the platform where there is the most arguing and there is the most uh, explaining to do and, 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 and things can get taken out of context and things can get thrown around and posted to other platforms that it has the potential to become problematic. Um, however, I think that, you know, it's, it's also a really great way to connect with people. It's a really great way to um, develop mutual friends and to, you know, I, I've met up with a lot of uh, Jewish activists and, and pro-Israel activists through platforms like Twitter and Instagram. Um, Instagram is definitely more visual, of course. Um, it's, to me, it's more casual. It's more fun. I, you know, I post a lot of more life updates there. And, 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 and to go back to your question about the positive aspects of it, it's been so wonderful letting my own um, life, my own experience um, shine through all of this work because I feel like that uh, motivates people just like me who you know, are, are Zionist, who are Jewish, and who are also in the, the LGBT community to be themselves as well and to, and to make noise in their own spaces. So it's good to have um, platforms where you can make your point and uh, to further your argument, but to also let your own personality be kind of a beacon of hope for people who may be like you in the same position as you who are looking for someone to look up to. And I've had a lot of positive experience from people who fall just right in that category. Um, so I'm gonna keep doing it. Absolutely, <laughs> as you should. Wow. And I'll say, I mean, we mentioned this before, but I just think it's you know fun to share. I DM'd Blake randomly on Instagram. When I saw him walking through Central Park, I had myself a fangirl moment. And Blake immediately responded to me and invited me to join, to invited me to join him in the park. I mean, I just think you're so right. You are such this wonderful, inclusive person. And I think it's beautiful that you've been able to share your story and make people more comfortable with who they are as a result. So thank you for that. Emily? I think that for me, the platform which I like the most is also Twitter. I think it's the one I'm most active on. Maybe it's something about wanting to be, uh, it's it's the most political, po most political platform. I was going to say, I think maybe it's something to do with wanting to be in politics in the first place. There's a lot of different issues that I cover. I speak about a lot of different human rights issues, for example. So Twitter really is the place where I like to be the most. That being said, I'm not sure it's the most important these days. Um, there's a huge battle with anti-Semitism on TikTok, which is my least favorite platform by far. Um, but I do think it's important to be present in those places and to be pushing back against not just the anti-Israel misinformation that we see, but the, the clear-cut anti-Semitism. So there wasn't a lot of information in the English media about what was happening except against Israel. So I took it upon myself to research this issue a little bit more deeply and to provide a, a summarized version of what the arguments are. So this type of content I found, I get a lot of responses, especially in private messages and discussions, not just people agreeing or disagreeing, but people who are genuinely curious and want to know more about these issues because a lot of what they're seeing in the media is oversimplification and it tends to be very, very anti-Israel. So that's been the most rewarding thing for me personally when it comes to responses on social media. I think that's something that we don't think about as much, right? That, you know, you're in your comment section, fine, all good. Everyone can see it, but we don't see, you know, who is DMing you all on social media and asking you really difficult questions. And I think to engage in that kind of conversation is exhausting and so important because you have to meet people where they are. And so, Emily, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that's such an important point and something that we all really need to keep in mind. I just wanted to add one more thing really quickly. Yeah, please. That something that's interesting about social media, about Israel in general, is that one of the one of the ways I've seen the most interaction in private messages that's different from what the comment sections are is in Arabic. A lot of the content that we see in Arabic about Israel, you'll see thousands of comments that are bashing Israel or even anti-Semitic comments. But then on those same pages, which I managed when I was a part of another organization, all of the comments or all of the messages, I mean, almost all of them are positive. How can I come to Israel? How can I know more about Israel? I support Israel. So there's a huge difference sometimes of what you see in a private message versus what you see in a comment section. Wow. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Wow. Yeah. Halal, anything to add? Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, so I'm in awe because Blake, Emily, like Twitter's the worst place in the world and it's <laughs> not a real place. Like genuinely, it's it's not real and it's awful. Um, I, I tweeted very heavily in college uh, and I'm happy I did because I grew a platform there and it eased me into other 
into other social media platforms. I see Blake laughing. Um, it's just, I tweeted I, very heavily in college. Like I did. I was like, oh like, my God, heavily, like, but like I 2 a.m. Like, you know what I mean? Like the whole, like the fight, like the people you shouldn't even fight. Like, you know, and I'm happy other I people, did this then, but I don't. Other people go to college and like yeah. drink. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> goes to college and tweets. I was just like, it was very, it was all I did. And whatever, I'm happy I did that. It eased me into other platforms, but I enjoy Instagram the most. Maybe also because I feel like my tar target demographic, these like liberal Zionist, young, you know, modern and progressive, but like figuring out the nuance of Israel and how to interact with it. I think they're, they like Instagram better. And I think that's why I've been focusing on it uh, more the last few years um, and getting a better engagement with them. But each platform serves its purpose. Uh, unlike Blake or Emily, I have no interest or never had an interest in being a politician. Uh, and Twitter eats your soul away. So, no. Actually, no, I do enjoy my private conversations in Twitter. Like, similar to what Emily said, like, a lot happens behind the seats and then, like, behind the sea scene and um, in these DMs with people from all over the world. And I, I'll still do that on Twitter. <laughs> Halal and Emily and Blake, you'll be able to answer this beautifully in a few weeks when, you know, you move to Israel. Um, but Halal and Emily, I'd love to hear from you both. You know, do you find that being an influencer and being in the position that you're in changes whether you're based in Israel or based in the United States? I definitely think that there's a big difference in perspective. And I'm sure Halal can speak to this as well, though at a different age. So it might be interesting to hear. We've actually never discussed this even. Um, I do see both sides, which is something that a lot of American Jews don't um, or maybe are not aware of if they haven't spent a significant amount of time in Israel. And a lot of Israelis don't understand the mentality and the perspective of American Jewry or diaspora Jewry. So being in that position and being able to fully see both sides, I think is critical. I'm not sure that it matters where you are physically at the moment, but it does matter if you spend a significant amount of time um, in both countries, because you really do start to understand why people think the way they do, why they approach these issues the way that they do, where the disconnect is in communication. There are a lot of, of misunderstandings between what's happening in Israel and why, and what American Jewry thinks should be happening in Israel. And As why. you said earlier, Emily, like when you, when you oversimplify, the news oversimplifies things, and when you oversimplify, you lose any, any sort of nuance, right? So yeah. I think being in this field or working actively in this field, it, it is important to understand both both realms, the Israeli uh, point of view and the American point of view. Um, it's interesting though, because uh, Blake and Emily have an experience that I I don't. I don't have the whole campus anti-Israel, you know, growing up here. I don't have that. I'm very aware that I don't have that experience, but I have a different one from here, right? So I don't think it really matters where you are, but it probably makes a difference in you're part of the fight, if that makes sense, right? Like we're all a giant mechanism. I love saying this, but we're all a giant mechanism and it only works if we all do our part, right? So they've both, both interacted on the campus front as well, but I'm sure it's gonna change when Blake does move here. It will be different, not better or worse or whatever, but, but it's different. I think Halal also has an interesting experience because um, although I made Aliyah at 22, I think it was, um, I didn't do the army and she actually did. So again, this is an important perspective to be able to communicate and explain to an American audience what yeah. really happens and why. And in fact, what Halal served in is actually, I met her when she was in the army, professionally we met, um, but they, you know, she worked, she worked in Koga. I don't know, Halal, do you want to add some of what you did? Um, <clears throat> sure, I was, uh, I was on the new media desk of the Coordination of Government Activities in the Territory. So it's part Ministry of Dep Defense, part IDF. And I and uh, one other person essentially launched the social media for this unit to get out data about the unit actually working in the West Bank and along the Gaza border. Um, and Emily came in then uh, to consult with us as we launched the digital just so many years ago, uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, and yeah, I've definitely taken that experience with me, the whole military Israel training, you know, but she's right, that experience makes a difference in, in understanding the and what the challenges are in, in terms of communication. Like, I think you have a unique perspective that a lot of people don't, even people who made Aliyah. Um, I'm never going to have the same perspective of, as you on those issues because yeah. I haven't had those experiences. And I won't have the campus. Yeah. Right. So we each, we all work together. So back to the mechanism, but it, it fits. 
Yeah, I'm loving watching you all bring these stories out of each other. You all know each other. And it's just so yeah. fun having you all, you know, be able to remind each other. Tell us about this. I know that you've experienced this. And it's just, it's really incredible to watch how you're all in your own niche, but are also each other's, you know, really each other's biggest supporters here. So thank you for showing us that side as well. Blake, I want to kick this next question to you first, but I would love to hear from everybody. Emily, you mentioned this. There is this growing movement to make anti-Zionism not only socially acceptable, but to make it distinct from anti-Semitism. How are you all combating this work with what you're doing? Yes, uh, it's a really great question because I, I think it's very important to not only defend Zionism, but to also prosecute anti-Zionism. Um, and I've made that a part of my activism and a part of my writing and just pre uh, presence online in general since I started um, a couple years ago. And what that means to me is convincing people and persuading people with facts and truth that anti-Zionism is not a liberal, progressive, enlightened, forward-thinking movement um, that is that is is in line with things like Black Lives Matter and things like criminal justice reform and reproductive freedom and climate change activism and, and like I'm gonna cry <laughs> whatever issue you can you know you can find on the American college campus. Um, it is in fact a radical, um, colonial, imperial, anti-Semitic reactionary movement that up until the 1970s sounded nearly indistinguishable from Nazism because indeed it was fashioned using the language of, of European anti-Semites and that became part of anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism in the Middle East. Um, and you know, some of the most effective ways I feel like advancing our argument is just putting a side by side between white nationalists in the United States who everybody knows are evil, who everybody knows, you know, are, are destructive force and putting them side by side and their words side by side with some of the most prominent anti-Israel um, uh, figures and, and speakers, right? And really finding the areas in which they overlap and there are quite a lot and showing that to your audience and saying, this is indistinguishable. You know, this isn't just the horseshoe theory where, you know, both sides of the political spectrum get closer together as they get farther apart. This is like a circle, you know, and, and, and <laughs> they're in the same wheelhouse. They're using the same language. They're using the same rhetoric. And also ask yourself what in effect anti-Zionism would actually do. What exactly are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that one of the smallest, most hated minorities in the Middle East loses their right to self-determination and self-defense? And, and, and what other what other nation would you propose that for? Would you propose that for the Kurds? Would you propose that for the Uyghurs? Would you propose that for the Taiwanese? Would you propose that for the Palestinians? You know, and so once you explain it in these terms that anti-Zionism is actually not what it seems, it is actually rather different from how it has been presented to them. And they've been manipulated by people who do not have the best interest for either you or the Jewish people at heart. You see this light bulb go off. And that's been one of the most rewarding things um, in my work is seeing this light bulb go off in young progressives, especially young progressive Jews that oh wait, something else is going on here and I maybe have to look into this issue a little bit uh, a little bit further. This is something that has actually come up in quite a few lectures that I've given. Um, and I've challenged people to give me an example of anti-Zionism that is not anti-Semitic. And so far in all of my travels and lectures and even online discussions, I've never been able to hear anything, any example of anti-Zionism that is not anti-Semitism except if you are a complete anarchist and you oppose self-determination for any people, because to oppose only the self-determination of the Jewish people and no other self-determination of any people is inherently anti-Semitic. And I think that this is something that a lot of people don't understand when it comes to the conversation today about Zionism or rather anti-Zionism. They're both so good. There's almost like nothing to add each. Um... But I will say, um, I think it's important to kind of take a step back and like we're also like in this world and everything makes sense and we understand these terms and whatever. I like to go back and just talk about what Zionism is. 
right? Because there's this whole like myth, like under misunderstanding. They've they've tried to reclaim it, right? The anti-Israel movement. So I like to focus a little bit more personally. I mean, everything's very important mechanism, but um, I like to focus on just kind of what is a Zionist, right? And which brings me into liberal Zionism and connecting the progressive causes and reminding how that that is Zionist. Um, because once they take that word, it doesn't matter what anti-Zionist, whatever. I don't think they understand the terminology. I don't people. I don't think people care enough to look into things to take a simple Google. What is the actual definition of Zionism? Um, so I focus a little bit more on that. I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, Halal's completely right. I think defining Zionism and helping people understand what it is, is really key. Um, but one of the things, one of the most common misconceptions about Zionism that I have consistently encountered is that people think Zionism is mutually exclusive, meaning right. that if there is a Jewish and democratic state of Israel, then that means there can't be a Palestinian state or Which that Palestinians insanity. don't that's have not what right. that means at all. Right. Right. This is yeah, not so a I movement think, that's mutually exclusive. Right. So I think that first step is really making sure like re-educating people on what that word actually means. Um, and then from there. I was going to say, so I, I started a nonprofit last year, which is still crazy to even say, because I, I, I'm in disbelief that I actually did it, um, that we did it, that, that my fellow co-founders and I did it called the New Zionist Congress. And, and the mission, we're actually launching um, chapters, our first in-person chapters post-COVID this, this upcoming fall. Um, and the mission of it, it, I mean, it's called the New Zionist Congress, and it's because exactly what Hillel and Emily said, there appears to be a wide uh, misunderstanding of what Zionism is, and, and, and a belief that even the people who do know what it means, that Zionism has to be one exact thing, you know, maybe it's just all out support for Israel, regardless of what Israel does, or, or, or maybe it's just, you know, you have to be religious, or you have to be secular, there's, there's this whole Right. Zionism to me is believing in the best version of Israel and fighting for that. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's not one. Right. And so the goal of this organization is to bring together a bunch of different minds, a bunch of different opinions, a bunch of different perspectives and interpretations, you know, with the only with the only uh, baseline agreement being that the Jews have the right to self-determination in their ancestral homeland. Um, and so once we get people in a room who agree on that, we can actually have really beautiful conversations and think of uh, really great ideas uh, for the future and how we best want to mold that society based on our own beliefs and values. Wow. You all are giving us such incredible tools in our tool, in our tool belt for when we have these conversations. I mean, I'm so excited to go back and listen to these exact answers when this is on demand because wow, you're all just so eloquent and you're all giving us so much to think about when we're going into these conversations about distinguishing between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and how there is no difference. And I just cannot thank you all enough for walking us through that. Let's look a little more broadly at the region. Israel has obviously had a huge, a lot of new relationships have been built as a result of the Abraham Accords. I would love to hear from you all how that's translated to social media and have you all been able to build relationships with your counterparts um, in North Africa, in the Gulf? What's it like to see influencers in the Gulf be so outwardly pro-Israel? Tell us more. I think in my case, um, having worked or, or managed uh, Arabic content before the Abraham Accords um, and tracked some of what's happening and the rhetoric there versus what's happening after the Abraham Accords, you see a significant, that's the thing that struck me the most, is that you saw a significant difference in the way that Emiratis and Bahrainis initially, also Moroccans, speak about Israel on social media. And of course, there's criticism online. Uh, there probably always will be. But we saw positivity and um, a willingness to speak to Israelis and to be outwardly pro-Israel in Arabic on social media that didn't exist before the Abraham Accords. Um, and it was really, really revolutionary, not just in terms of the peace agreement, but the people to people peace. And that translated to social media, which actually almost never happens. The rhetoric tends to be lower level on social media than it is in person. Uh, and that wasn't really what we saw. Uh, and unfortunately that has continued until today. So I'm hopeful that uh, if and when there are more partners from Arab countries on board uh, with the Abraham Accords or with subsequent peace agreements, that we will see a similar trend. Um, and uh, Emily and I actually a year and a half ago were on a delegation with a group of Israeli uh, celebrities and activists to Dubai for three days. So this is a few months after the Abraham Accords. Um, I'm very happy we got to do that together as well. 
Uh, it was a bunch of new people, but uh, we had a few friends and it was really, I don't know, mind blowing to meet our counterparts, um, see how, how excited they were for peace. And I know that it doesn't speak for the entire population of the UAE, but that itself was inspiring. Um, I don't think my parents or grandparents ever thought that that would be a thing that their, their family one day would get to do. Um, so that's really beautiful. You know, even more than that, when I visited Bahrain for the first time um, on my own, not with a group, the interaction from people who like knew or saw or, you know, I was introduced when they found out that I was from Israel, that me and Yosef, we went together. They were so excited. Yeah. They were so excited to speak to Israelis <clears throat> and to have conversations and to have peace between the two countries. And that was just such a surreal experience because, you know, I've been to Cairo before. I've been to Jordan. It's not like that. The, the vibe was completely different, completely. So it's very, very exciting. It is exciting. Um, actually, only like one year ago, a delegation of uh, Bahrainians, Moroccans, and uh, Emiratis came to Israel. And I was part of a small group, and we toured the country with them for a full week. Uh, the whole thing's documented. There's a, a documentary, uh, Finding Abraham. But just seeing all their faces, their eyes, as they, as they meet different kinds of Israelis and see the country in it, it gives me a lot of hope. I mean, we, you know, and it was, it was really amazing to kind of see it in them as well, our, uh, our golf cousin. I, and, and just from my perspective, I don't, I don't have these sort of intimate relationship that, that Emily, yes. love me, but yet, but I will say that um, I think that there is just something so beautiful. You know, president Biden said a couple weeks ago when, when he landed in, in Israel that, you know, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Mm -hmm. And indeed you can be an Arab or Muslim and, and, and be a Zionist. And I think mm -hmm. just, just shattering that that belief that, you know, in order to be a Zionist, in order to believe in Israel's right to exist, you have to be, you know, a Jew and involved in Jewish circles um, is just not true. And now you're seeing it from the people, um, the very people who in, in the Israeli imagination were never going to accept Israel. And I think now we have this sense of, well, ev anything is possible and everything is yeah. possible. In the future. There's a definite energy of like the shift here in the Middle East. And it's really cool to watch. Israelis, I mean, have for decades been under the impression that they're in a very hostile neighborhood and that they are, you know, and that manifested itself as wars, as intifadas, as the threat of, of nuclear annihilation. And to have glimmers of hope there that in fact, this is not the status quo anymore. And, and people are, are willing to come to the table and, and to speak with you and to recognize your existence. I don't think the the psychological, emotional implications of that can be understated. It's to be welcomed finally as you're not foreigners, you're not invaders. This is the third crusader state. You know, you're here, you come from here, your language, your culture, your religion is all of this land. To have that validation finally is, is, is a very good thing, is very welcomed. Mm. Wow. I can like feel the overwhelming emotion. Um, I think that's incredible. And thank you, Halal and Emily for telling us more about your direct experiences. And Blake, I can't wait to hear about your direct experiences in just a few months. So I want to take us back to this neck of the woods, to the United States, to Blake's neck of the woods for the time being. You know, you all mentioned it. Students face the brunt of this anti-Israel hate on social media. In the work that you all do, how are you empowering college students, particularly on American college campuses, to feel confident enough to stand up against anti-Israel bias on social media? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to let them know and to make them feel like they're not alone. Um, what, I've, what I've found is that a lot of Jewish young people, a lot of Jews on college campuses, will refrain from speaking out on social media, will refrain from, and social media, by the way, is not as important as speaking up against the people within your own social circles who are doing and saying things that you don't like and who are um, and, and, and who are uh, actively engaged in working against the Jewish community on campus, like, you know, supporting BDS resolutions that defund Hillel and Chabad, supporting initiatives that remove Israeli scholarship from campus or that punish professors for, you know, going to Israel or things like that. Um, I have found that what one of the main reasons why these young people don't do this is because they're afraid of the social ramifications and they're afraid of the consequences. So in order to, to lead them to water, in order to, to equip them with the resources, we first need to say that regardless of what happens, regardless of what friends you may lose, because let's be honest, you may lose a few like I did, um, 
you will have people to support you and you will have a community to rely on and you will have people who are in your corner. That's the first thing. The second thing is education. Um, and it's, it's, it's really not enough. I have found to just, you know, equip people uh, with pro-Israel talking points with Zionist talking points. Um, you really need to get into the weeds of the politics of what is being discussed. Um, and, and from there, you need to form your own opinions. You know, you need to read more books. You need to listen to more podcasts. You need to meet with more experts. You need to do a lot of, uh, a lot of listening and a lot of, of absorbing of information um, if you really want to be serious in this fight. And that doesn't need to be a hard process. That can actually be a very liberating um, process because you, you will learn so much more about your people um, and their contemporary successes and struggles um, in, in the process of doing so. And um, I think once people get a taste of that, at least from my perspective, and this is my own story, once people get a taste of that, that there's, oh my, oh my goodness, there's this whole world of, of, of nuance and gray area and, and, and people and places and things that I didn't know about or didn't know enough about, um, then they get more passionate and then they get uh, th th their, their arguments become sharper and crisper and, and they become more useful to the Jewish community. So um, I would say, uh, tell them, teach them that they're not alone, show them that they're not alone, education and then empowerment. I also, I agree with everything that Blake said. Um, I do think education is really important, but I think that unfortunately what I've seen is that a lot of students don't have the, um, desire to dig deep into the issues like I did. <laughs> um, you know, some students, they just want to get through college and get their degree and move on with their lives. They don't want to be Israel activists. So I think that at its core, what these students really need to understand is that being Jewish and even not being, being pro-Israel is something to be proud of. Because right now what they're being taught is that Israel is this evil pariah state, human rights violator, all of these things that aren't true, that they can defend if they invest the time into understanding what these arguments are, where the nuance is, what the background is, all of these in-depth issues. But on top of that, they need to understand what anti-Semitism is, and they need to understand what modern anti-Semitism is. And so if someone comes to a Jewish student or a Jewish group on campus and wants them to answer, for example, uh, what the IDF did in Gaza uh, last May, this is anti-Semitism. Holding Jews accountable for what the state of Israel did when they're not an Israeli, haven't served in the IDF, have no connection other than the fact that they're Jewish, is a form of modern anti-Semitism. And we need to be able to empower these students to know that and to be able to say that confidently. And that, like Blake, Blake stated at the beginning, requires them knowing that they're not alone. Even if they're not experts on the issue, they don't need to answer every single question about what Israel does and whether or not they were right and in what, in what they were right and what they were wrong. But they do need to be able to identify when they are being targeted or when their community is being targeted with anti-Semitism. And I think that's something that's kind of lacking today because there's so much pressure from the outside. And the other thing that I've told students that I've spoken to is that it's not, you can't expect it to be easy. It's going to be difficult and you're going to face some pushback and you might lose friends and people might not like you. But again, you're not alone. And it, you do it because it's the right thing to do. And because if you don't, much like social media, then the starting point of the whole conversation only gets more and more extreme. You have to stand up and fight. You have to. They said it perfectly. There's literally nothing to add. No, honestly. Um... It's, it's, it's true. I know a lot of people feel alone and we're all there with you. I want to end our conversation today with a little inspiration for everybody watching. In one sentence, what, would you, what advice would you give to someone who is looking for the courage to advocate for Israel on social media? Halal, let's start with you. You have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And once you cross that barrier, it gets better and you'll find your people and you'll feel the support more. But really just come to terms with feeling uncomfortable pushing that barrier and and it's okay you know loving israel is not fighting is not supporting everything she does but it's fighting for her to be her best self so kind of to take that with them my advice would be to never stop learning i'm still learning yeah. things about different issues and topics related to the israeli palestinian conflict every day and i know a lot <laughs> i know a lot about different issues so you're always going to be learning. There's always something you don't know. And that's okay. Start today. Start today. Yeah. 
Blake, what's your final message? I would say that you're in good company. Uh, mm. there, the Jewish people have a very long and very proud history of individuals who risk a lot uh, to advocate for our for our world, for for our people, uh, for our nation, uh, and and whether or not those people succeeded in the ways that they wanted to, they each had a profound impact on the way that we think about the Jewish people today, whether we think about Natan Sharansky, Hannah Shenish, Theodore Herzl, Golda Meir, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and, and I draw my biggest inspiration from, from those figures um, and they inspire me to keep going. And I think all it takes is, you know, a, a student, a young person to find one person in the Jewish world deceased or alive that they look up to and that they admire the work of. And that can be a really great motivator to, to continue in their footsteps. It has been such a privilege spending this time with you all. You are all so brilliant and so committed and I cannot thank you enough for your time and for being with us. Thank you. Thanks so much. For having us. <laughs> and thanks to you all for joining us on the APAC app. If you'd like to see more from today's panelists, you can follow them on social media. Check out the event description for links to their Instagram and Twitter pages. See you next time.